Okay, so welcome everyone to this week's Origins uh, Colloquium. Uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, Dominique Segura Cox uh, visiting. So, Dominique was an undergraduate at the University of Michigan and uh, then did her PhD at the University of Illinois, uh, graduating in 2017. Uh, she was then a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in the, the Center for Astrochemical Studies with Paolo Caselli. Um, and currently, since 2021, has been an NSF uh, postdoctoral fellow at the University of Texas. And I see on the screen you're starting as an assistant professor at the University of Rochester. So great. So that's great. Congratulations. And uh, yeah, we look forward to your talk, Dominic. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm a radio astronomer, I study star formation, and I know uh, it's the beginning of summer, so there's a lot of students, so uh, I kept that in mind for the summer students when I made the talk. Um, uh, and then, yeah, students especially um, break in, even if it's not in discussion time yet, um, if you don't understand something, or if like I'm going way off and you don't know what's happening. Um, yeah, so I'm interested in how the youngest protostars um, accrete their mass from their larger scale environments and how that might be connected to the early phases of planet formation. So quick start to the star formation process. Um, so I think of like the largest um, unit of star formation that you start with is the molecular cloud. So um, like if you've ever seen the Milky Way in the night sky, um, and like if you've gone camping or something, that dark band is dark amidst all those brighter stars um, in that stripe on the sky because you're actually looking at our Milky Way's molecular cloud. So this is one of them. This is the Perseus molecular cloud. Um, I feel like this is probably my hometown. <laughs> um, I know this molecular cloud the best. So this is an infrared image that was taken with the Spitzer Space Telescope. And you see that the molecular cloud, which is made of both gas and dust, but mostly hydrogen and helium, um, it's got all these like uh, stringy structures within it, but there's not really a huge, large scale, like coherent thing. There's a lot of chaos at this level. Um, part of that is because there's a lot of turbulence um, in the interstellar medium, in the molecular cloud. So things are getting stirred up. Um, and disturbed a bit. Um, and in some ways, turbulence can sort of disrupt um, star formation. But on the other hand, sometimes it can actually help make some parts of the interstellar medium denser, um, sometimes to the point where it can start to collapse. So it's complicated, turbulence does something. <laughs> um, and then on the other hand, so there's all these little teeny tiny points that are also in this image. So each one of them is a protostar. So in the Perseus molecular cloud, there's about 300 individual protostars, and about half of those are in binary systems. And um, I forgot to mention earlier, but I mostly work on low mass star formation. So these are protostars that are going to be like our sun or sit in that range. Um, high mass is cool too, but there's too much to do for one person. So I focus on the low mass side. Um, and then, um, I just wanna I just wanna like zoom in on some of these like smaller structures here, these long stringy things. So those are what we call filaments. Um, so filaments are pretty cool because this seems to be where magnetic fields might play a role. Um, there's been some observations where magnetic fields tend to sort of go perpendicular to the magnetic field on the outside of the filament. So just as they're about to go in. But then there's some observations where we also see that in the filaments, the uh, magnetic fields seem to run parallel to the filament. So there's clear correlation with the change of the magnetic field structure. So this is like another unit of star formation. So these filaments tend to be denser than the surrounding molecular cloud. And then eventually, if you get dense enough, you get these really dense structures called cores. And cores are sort of the unit of gravitational collapse. So they're bound units of material. So that could mean that they're gravitationally bound or pressure bound. But either way, uh, there's a really good chance 
that these things are going to collapse to actually form a protostar. So uh, we're going to ignore scales larger than core for the rest of the talk. Um, or we might touch just a bit on filaments, but um, this is like the first image you can like keep in your mind. Okay, so like, this is sort of this last process that starts. So because there was all of that motion, um, either from turbulence in the um, uh, larger scale molecular cloud, or because uh, or or um, motion in the filaments, perhaps magnetically dominated. Um, either way, um, it it winds up making it so that the it doesn't just collapse from like a steady state. So meaning there's probably a little bit of rotation in this. So if you have collapse plus rotation, that means that you have to conserve um, uh, angular momentum somehow. And one way of doing that is forming a disk. So deep, deep down inside, at some point, usually very early in the process, a disk will start to form. And then we love disks because um, we've known for several years now that disks have what we call substructure. So instead of being smooth, they have either rings or spirals in them. Now, rings or spirals, these substructures, are pretty important to planet formation because if they didn't exist, if you had any planetesimals that started to form and get kind of chunky and big on the outside of your smooth disk, they would wind up undergoing drag forces really efficiently and they would just spiral into the central protostar on time scales that are just too short to form a planet. And that can actually happen when you start having stuff that's about the size of a softball, but you don't have to get really big for planets to be like basically impossible in a smooth disk. Luckily, I don't think I've really seen a smooth disk once you actually resolve it with enough structure or, or with enough resolution to actually start seeing the structure. Um, so one way or another, these structures are probably related to plants. So obviously it would be, you would have more material and it's denser in sort of the rings or the spirals than it would be in any of these gaps or um, uh, sort of uh, darker, darker areas um, in these spirals here. Just less material there. So there's a lot of variation in these disks and structures, but um, you have two scenarios that, that go on with why these are related to planets. One is um, the, the material in these rings might wind up getting dense enough but they sort of have this buffer from, from spiraling, spiraling inwards in, in the gap. Um, so in the ring, they might actually uh, be able to grow things beyond the size of a softball. And then you actually uh, could start to get like proper like asteroidy type things and keep growing larger and larger and larger. Okay, so that's one way. The other way might be maybe we're already beyond this step. Maybe the planet or baby planet has gotten large enough that you can actually, it will go through and either sweep up all of the material that's sort of in its path, and that could clear out um, this gap here. Um, and by sweep up, it could accrete some of that material, but it can also uh, just sort of push some of the material to the side and up to the rings. So it doesn't have to eat everything it sweeps out, but it still clears a path in the disk, maybe. So. It's a little bit of a chicken and an egg problem <laughs> because in the first scenario, you kind of already need a ring to make a planet. But in the second scenario, you had a planet make a ring. So where's the first rings come from? So that sort of summarizes like the basic starting point, the traditional star formation schematic. So you start um, from your pre-stellar core, stuff starts to collapse. Uh, usually there's a bit of rotation, so then you form a, a smooth protostellar disk. That was what we thought for a while. At some point, substructure forms somehow. Um, and then, well, this one we're most sure of because like we exist, right? Okay, on to what I do. So I'm really interested in linking up these sites. Um, so I want to know in like, not just uh, understanding what a disk is or what a molecular cloud is doing, I want to see how we go from material at those large scales and funnel it all the way down to 
those planet forming Gibson scales. Um, so this is just one example, um, but it's really nice to visually illustrate what I mean. So this is the filament, right? So it's got this long and skinny structure. Um, these little points of light here are your protostars again, but we're going to focus in on this one, and we're going to zoom in into that little box. So when Alma turned on, uh, we all got really excited, and we immediately jumped from kind of observing like cores to getting all the way into disk like immediately. Um, and when we did that, sometimes we found weird stuff like this. Um, so this is dust, and notice the difference here. So this is 300 AU, and this is 30,000 AU, right? Huge differences in order of magnitude. Um, but, you know, it's not, it's not like an ellipse, like those other uh, disks that we saw on the previous slide. So what gives? Why is this like this? Well, this is actually a very, very young protostar that's much younger than uh, the, the protostellar disk that we saw on the previous slide. Um, so that means that they're likely experiencing much more infall. So a lot of protostars, they gain their mass, most of their mass very, very quickly, and then it sort of starts to taper off. And you keep gaining mass for a while, but the main accretion phase is usually um, over by the time we got to that slide that I had all those pre disks on. Um, so when we, when we answered the very young sources, we saw this uh, in one of them. So it's kind of big for a disk. Most disks are around 100 AU-ish. So is it really a disk? What's going on here? This is dust. So that means that we don't have spectra. So we don't have Doppler motion. And we can't see if there's any rotation or understand what the actual physical structure is just from this data. But um, one thing that intrigued us was that there's this thing here, which really wants to point up in this direction, right? Uh, which is also the direction where the filament comes from. So is there a connection in scales there? So uh, me and a collaborator, we went to Noema, um, which is a uh, interferometer in the French Alps. Um, it's a radio telescope. And then we observed in GET. So we could get those uh, Doppler shifts and we could start to understand the kinematics or how things move in the system. And uh, again, note the size scale here is about 5,000 AU. And what's amazing is that there's this huge structure here that actually, uh, when we model the velocities, um, we can we can actually find like an infalling trajectory, like, like with mass. <laughs> And we can confirm that that actually is infalling along like sort of this direction. Um, this is relatively low resolution data. Um, but the other thing I just want to point out about this is that it's uh, 10,000 AU in length. And that's approximately, if we go back to this slide, that's less. That's approximately the size scale of a pre-stellar core. Um, and the other fun thing about observing it in this weird molecule in particular, HC3N, um, is that HC3N doesn't live for very long uh, in a really dense, dense core environment. Like it should basically break apart and turn into other molecules by the time it falls into, or before it has time to actually fall all the way down. Um, like if it was hanging out in the dense core the whole time. So the fact that this streamer is larger than the size of the dense core, and it's made of a completely different chemistry, um, is telling us that the material here uh, probably extends further. Our instrument just loses sensitivity here, coincidentally, but we've got follow-up observations coming. Um, but it probably connects to the larger scale molecular cloud where this molecule is abundant. So the larger scale molecular cloud is punching through the dense core and funneling material down with sort of this fresh chemistry that operates on short time scales. So we can use, we can use velocities and we can use chemistry to sort of pick apart like 
where these things come from and where they're going. What what is the mass of the coal? Uh, I think around five solar masses. Uh huh. So pretty, fairly low mass. Fairly low mass. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the central protostars. There's it's actually a binary system in here, uh, uh separated by twenty AU, and we use kinematics to model that as. I think the total mass of the binary system at the center is about one point two solar masses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Um, that was in my PhD thesis, and we use VLA data. Um, so VLA, um, it operates at long. Could you repeat the uh, question, uh, Dominic? Sorry, we couldn't oh, quite yeah, hear the question. Um, how do I know there's a binary there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so it's, a, it's VLA wavelength, and that means that, that means that the data is, um, or sorry, the, the emission is able to penetrate through the um, dense cocoon much easier. Um, so we can, and uh, it also winds up picking up like, because the VLA is amazing and you can get super high resolution. Um, we wound up getting like eight AU resolution. So we could like resolve like Jupiter orbits, even though we're not doing this, this is just stuff. So again, no motion, um, but yeah, there it is. Okay, so that brings me to what is a streamer, right? Because I called I called this dude a streamer, and I didn't really explain. That's because um, my friend Jaime Pineda, who was all he also worked with the Max Planck, which is where I did my first postdoc. Um, we named these structures that we found these asymmetric things um, that funnel material onto disks or protostars from larger scales. That's all it is. It's super simple. It's just a tail. <laughs> um, and we've seen them in low mass protostars. Uh, that's most of what I do at this point in my career is working on these in low mass. Uh, we have seen a few part papers out on the archive that suggest that they're in high mass protostars, but um, I haven't seen papers focusing on them too much, maybe one or two in the high mass regime, but they're there. I think that the high mass people just have other stuff to deal with. It's complicated. Um, and uh, we see them in the really, really young protostars that still have a very dense cocoon of material, um, as well as in the older phase. So like in those sources on that big array of disks that I showed you, there are sources that have both rings and streamers. So those are when there's Let's use their connection. Are they frozen for everyone? Yeah. Okay. This rarely happens. Oh. Uh, all right, please go on then, uh, Dominique. Yeah, I just got to get all of the annotations and things off my screen. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I stopped at the end of the slide. So uh, up next, go. Okay, so this is another streamer. So there's that one that I showed you um, all the nice observations for. 
Um, but this was another one. So that was a class zero, which means one of the youngest protostars. This is class one. So, you know, it gets hotter as I get older. Um, so in this case, so this is um, just another molecule, H13CO plus for my purposes. I don't really care what the molecule is as long as I have enough spectral resolution so I can see all the nice Doppler shifts and model the infall. Um, so in this case, this is demonstrating kind of a textbook example of what streamer trajectories are like. And these are not just things that I drew on in Keynote. Um, these are actually like plotted model trajectories. So there was a fitting process involved in this. I had to iteratively go through and sort of converge on the solution. And we're working on more and more ways to make that automated. So um, this thing falls in. Um, the dust disk is in these contours uh, and the gas disk is larger. Um, that's normal, we expect that because I mentioned earlier, there's aerodynamic drag forces that act on these particles. That's true for even dust. So it makes sense that the dust disk is a little bit smaller than the gas disk. Um, okay, great. So it looks like they're connected, but protostars also have outflows. They eject material as they accrete. Um, so is this an outflow or, or something that's infalling or something completely unrelated to the source? Like maybe it just happens to line up uh, because of the way we're viewing it, but they're actually like, you know, 400 parts that away from each other. Uh, that's where, again, using the velocity information as well comes in because now we can actually see some coherence here. So down here, this is just the rotating disk. So you have the red shifted side uh, and the blue shifted side. So it's just spinning. And then this thing uh, has a, uh, it starts out kind of red shifted and then sort of smoothly goes to an intermediate velocity. And then suddenly it turns blue and merges really smoothly with the blue shifted side of the disk. And you'll notice here that there's like a really sharp discontinuity that's the only sharp spot like in this map of the velocity. So what's happening at this spot is that um, these two things aren't actually interacting because they just overlap uh, with the viewing angle. Uh, what's happening is that the streamer falls in, sort of moves um, away from the viewer a bit, and then wraps around behind the disc and then gets um, sort of pulled into here. So think about like wrapping up spaghetti on a fork. That's basically what's going on. Um, yeah, and then what we've started to do is uh, we're gonna be referring to the impact zone. So that's just the area where the transition is most clear from um, the infalling streamer to that rotating disk. So this, this sort of transition zone or impact zone, right? That's where the streamer is actually making contact and merging. And surprise, um, that dust disk in the center actually has really faint fuzzy rings. So this is one of the youngest known protostellar disks that have uh, those substructures in it that might be linked to planet formation. Okay, so remember earlier we were like chicken or egg, what comes first, the planet or the rings? Well, this protostar um, is still so young that it's really unlikely that you have like a whole planet formed yet. Like there just hasn't been enough time to build it up um, based on like what we expect theoretically. Um, so there's a chance that given that time scale issue and given that these are sort of a different type of ring, like it's fuzzy, it's not so cleared out. Maybe this is like the primordial rings that might eventually form the first planet. Like, um, that we have this uh, sort of like more enhanced area here. Um, so that might, you know, be a really prime spot for a planet to start forming. Not saying there's planets there yet. But conditions are looking good. What, what kind um, of accretion rate is, does the star have, uh, Dominique? Sorry, what's that? What kind of accretion rate uh, does the star have here? Do you know? Oh, um, it was published in eDisc. 
It's in it's in um, Flores 2023 down here. Ah. They actually measured it. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just don't have that number on the top of my head. Sure, but sure. I think it's uh, on the order of like 10 to the minus 6, though. Okay, it's pretty high, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Ilsa confirms 10 to the minus 6. <laughs> okay. So, oh, oh, yeah, last point. Um, but I, I put the slide up just to show that, you know, you have interfalling material and stuff raining down onto the disk. My earlier point was sometimes that might have a different chemistry if it comes from way far away outside of the natal core. Um, all of this happening on times when you're setting up the initial conditions for planet formation. So like everything's happening at the same time. It's not that stars form first and then planet. It's all one process all together. And there's lots of crazy and fall going on from large scale still. Maybe about uh, 10 minutes or so, Dominique, if that's okay. I know we had an interruption. Uh, yep. Yeah, uh, actually, that's perfectly on time for what I have to. Great. Um, yeah. So uh, this brings me to the second half of the talk, which goes a little faster. Um, so just I want to focus in on those disks. So now that we know that everything's happening at the same time, um, how do those streamers actually change the properties of these known disks? They're about to form planets. Like, like let's get set up. Let's go. Um, one last thing I wanted to point out about this cool disk is that uh, it is about the size of the solar system, and uh, it is 0 0.8 solar masses, so it's a sort of sun-like protostar, and it's got a solar system-ish disk. So maybe we can think of this as like a young solar system analog. Um, and I wound up calculating um, from the dust emission in just these rings, so everything outside of this inner gap, um, that out there, there's enough mass in material um, to form about 20 giant planet cores. So even if you have a 10% uh, planet formation efficiency, because the central protostar consumes the rest, you can still get two planets out there. Neat. Um, and then we can get back to chemistry just a little bit. So, um, I, now that I know that this is like ripe for planet formation, another important aspect of that, or to understand the chemistry in the area is to get a handle on the temperature of the system. So I went out and I looked at N2H plus. N2H plus, um, is a cold gas tracer because, um, when CO is in the gas phase, because the CO is warm, and by warm, I mean more than 17 Kelvin, <laughs> um, then CO will destroy the N2H+. Um, but if you see N2H+, it means it's cold because the CO has to be frozen into a layer on dust grains. Um, and it's possible that that actually might help make those dust grains more sticky. Uh, right? Just like building a snowball is easier than building a sand ball. <laughs> there's, there's, there's some debate. It's a complicated process, but maybe. Um, but if so, if there is a change in stickiness, that might actually help you um, to build up planets from dust grains uh, even faster. So icy grains might be good for growing planets sooner. Um, but one thing I noticed is that, okay, if you have a completely... If you have a disk that's only heated by your central protostar, you would expect this to be symmetric, but it has this horseshoe shape. There's missing flux here. So that means that something's going on over there to make it warmer. That's where we can't forget the environment, right? So now these are all plotted on the same side scale. Um, we actually see that we can find that the impact zone there, where you know the streamer is merging with the disk, um, lines up really well with the side of the disk where we're missing that, where it's getting warmer. So the cold gas tracer is telling us that it's, that, that uh, it should be warmer over there. But I also had one, well, I also had one warm gas tracer as well. Um, and we actually see that there's excess emission just in front of the impact zone, as if um, you can imagine like a street sweeper or a snowplow, like, 
like it's coming in, it's shocking the material um, and blasting the SO2 off of the dust grains. Uh, and then everything just starts to pile up in front. So I think that's what's going on here. But we have the warm gas tracer and the cold gas tracer both agreeing that the streamer is actually heating the disk up. And again, that's another way that streamers can change, you know, some of the chemistry that's going on there. It can deliver new stuff. And also, it can also cause different types of chemical reactions to go on, and it can shock the disk. Also, this isn't the only um, disk that has rings and streamers. Um, so this is the one I already talked about. Remember, no companions in this disk. But this one's a little bit older. It's actually being fed by two streamers. And then this protostar, or, or sorry, this disc here is, it has like a big ring and you're sort of looking at it like edge on. Um, so this was the gap. And then this is the same ring. It's just wrapped around. Um, and down here, there's actually a um, 70 Jupiter mass companion. So that's sort of like brown dwarf, you know, sort of between a planet and a protostar, or sorry, a planet and a star. Um, and it seems to be occurring somewhere near the radius where this streamer lands. Um, so maybe it really did help to build that thing up. And if you could build a brown dwarf that way, you can certainly build a planet that way. And then finally, this is HL Tau. HL Tau is like in textbooks now. This is what set off the whole uh, ring or spiral hunting craze. Um, it's kind of the king of disks, in my opinion. And HL Tau, even that has a streamer. So um, Antonio Garuffi actually invited me to, onto his paper specifically to um, model this tail that's falling in. And what's really cool about this is that HL Tau's rings um, have been studied extensively. We know everything about the geometry. And we also know that it's very symmetric. So uh, when I modeled the streamer, I actually found that this streamer comes in very close to the midplane. Um, and it must be doing so and entering the disk in such a way that um, it's only going through the top layers of the disk and not disturbing the midplane where the dust likes to live and hang out. Because the dust rings here are like symmetric and smooth, um, even though. Uh, yeah, these, these two images are plotted on the same size scale. So this gives us a little bit of a constraint on the geometry of the infalling streamers as well through doing this modeling and also taking into account not just the Doppler shifted velocities, but also some of, um, you know, the dust too. It really is a lot of putting a ton of different puzzle pieces together to try to get to this point. Um, so don't get, don't get stuck in the Oh, yeah, and this is just wrapping up here. So um, just starting to think about questions that we might have for um, uh, discussion. So one of the ones that I have is how common are streamers and are they the main path for protostars to gain their mass, right? Because just because I'm looking at streamers doesn't mean that there's not the rest of the infalling traditional core or infalling envelope um, that can contribute to the mass accretion process. And this has really been um, demonstrated by um, many of these observations. So except for this one and this one, all of these other uh, observations uh, were intended to observe something else. And these were found on accident, ser serendipitously. Um, and if you can find so many of these things on accident, including in an ALMA large program that was really meant to focus on disks, they're still finding stuff from the envelope that really matters, right? So that's the e-disk large program. So they're, they're finding time in, in many of their sources. So we're starting to get an idea that if they're easy to find, they're probably common. Um, and that's really what started to motivate me um, to really focus on this full time. So um, I, when I was working with Paula Caselli, she gave me the opportunity to lead a large program with NOEMA. So it covers 32 class zero and one protostars, which I'm in charge of, and eight class twos, a little bit older, 
uh, which somebody else is in charge of. But together, that means that there's five, 520 hours observed over four years. There's 7 million individual channels um, that need to be cleaned and analyzed, and I'm leading a big team, and they're amazing. And the data that's coming out of that will eventually, uh, after our proprietary period is over, 18 months after completion, we're, re we're releasing everything in a science-ready format for public use. So it's going to go public because that's way too much data for us to work on along. Um, but this is currently the only big program designed with streamers in mind and not as little accidents. And here are just some of our streamer results. So we have some that are infalling um, with two different um, streamers right on the outside of known outflows. So really, again, just to emphasize, using your velocities and modeling them is critical to determining if things are infall or outflow. They can get confused. Um, and this is another one uh, that was worked on by this awesome, uh, she's about to be a postdoc. She just got her PhD, I was working with her the whole time. I'm really proud of her. Um, and she actually uh, worked with some other data to show that uh, not only not only do you see streamers at these 2,000 new sky scales, you can start to pick them out if you have data that's more on the molecular cloud side, and then you can zoom into those for follow-up. And with her work, she showed that about 50% of protostars have maybe streamers that reach outside the core. Cool. <laughs> Depends on the age, though. Um, and then... This is another one that has a binary system. So for a long time, we used to think that this was just a spirally disk. This is some great work that um, uh, John Tobin did a while ago. Um, but now we understand that maybe that spiral might be caused by this infalling structure here. Don't know where my arrow went. <laughs> um, so another example of there's now some really close binaries. So do these, do these things start to form binaries? OK. so. That was what we thought when I started my PhD. And now I think this is where we're headed. It's not that much different. We're still, we still appreciate the, the infall from other areas. Um, but I think we have to appreciate that a lot of asymmetries happen in the star formation process early. Cores are never actually round. They're kidney bean shaped or a little elongated. Or something. There's turbulence inside those too. Then you can get infalling streamers, sometimes multiple ones um, that feed disks. And another change, there's now ring disks early in the star formation process, which means, yes, we can definitely form planets when there's still uh, infalling material. Um, and then, well, we're still here, so the last step so is still the same. Um, so with that, I'll just leave up some questions that might trigger some interest, and thank you. Great, thank you very much. So, uh, questions uh, for Dominique, and obviously somebody in Virginia can moderate there, please. Um, I have lots of questions, so maybe do Virginia first if there are particular questions. We have a few. So. Um, so yeah. What's the maximum amount of streamers that Bogotá can have? Is it just like two? No. And please repeat the question because we, we can't hear the microphone very well. Okay. Um, What's the maximum amount of streamers a protostar can have? Is it two? Um, so there's one um, paper by Jane Huang. She's the one that did this one on purpose. So I think there's another one called RU Loop, where um, it looks like it has a ton of these like gas spiral things that have large scales, but there's like 12 of them all coming in from the outside. So I think it really depends. Um, yeah, maybe on like how turbulent um, the outside, the uh, stuff in your core is, or um, it might have to do with the magnetic field and how strong that is um, in the regions where the streamers start to form. Or it might depend on how streamers form. It might form in multiple ways. Good question. Mm -hmm. So do you have socks in the impact zone and have you looked at that with sock tracers? Um, shots? So, um, do, do you have shocks in the impact zone and have you looked at those with shock tracers? So 
Um, there's oh, my hands not going. No. Um, uh, there's uh, um, somebody that I really want to collaborate soon, and she does great at, at observing these disk scale sulfur bearing shock tracers. Um, I only have the one that was. Um, yeah, I had SO2. So because this was not designed with this in mind, um, I do. I only have the one because SO2 just happened to fall into what I was observing, but I didn't need to do shocks or screamers or impact zones. Uh, oops. Um, but yeah, so there's uh, Elizabeth um, Arturo Villamois. Um, she's down in Chile right now. She's a postdoc and she's a shock queen. And um, I really want to work with her in the future. And we're going to put together like different, um, uh, different observing programs specifically meant to pick out some of these things that have these impact zones, get the shocks, get the shock properties. Then we can get um, use multiple shock tracers in the same spot to get um, uh, like density, temperature, abundance ratios of between like SO and SO2, which can tell us some stuff. Charles knows more about that. <laughs> um, yeah. What, what, kind of, uh, what kind of velocity is, do you think, is the shock here? Oh, um, we did calculate one in Valdivia Meta, and I think maybe uh, uh, in a Pineda paper. Um, but so far, using, using some of the information we have from our models and making a few assumptions, we're thinking that the shock velocities are like, two to five kilometers per second. Mm -hmm. and and is, that, is that essentially free fall at the, given the central mass at whatever, how many AU you are here? Yeah, or so two. actually, um, this one seems to be moving at faster than free fall. Not much faster, but a little bit. Um, and that might be because the only thing that sort of makes sense to us is that if it really is coming from outside of the core, maybe um, there's some gas velocity in this filament going this way. Um, that, that'd be mm -hmm. something Jaime Pineda would know a little bit more about. I focus on disk scales. He focuses on larger scales. Uh -huh. Great. I had a question about the, the chemistry in the streamers. I mean, you, you showed a whole bunch of different molecules you're using to trace them which is kind of surprising, like there's so many different uh, molecules being used. Is, is there yet a, uh, a chemical survey of some, some streamers where you can then model the chemistry? Um, I don't think we're doing that yet. I can't think of anybody and I haven't seen any papers. But you have the large uh, spectral bandwidth with the Noema, so don't you automatically get uh, a large uh, number of lines? Yeah, so I'm actually um, secretly hoping to get a postdoc next year that works a bit more with chemistry uh, that might be interested in doing that. Mm -hmm. But just in terms of the, of the detection of the streamer, do you know yet if, um, I mean, could you pick any molecule or is, are, these, are the ones that have been picked here the own, you know, where the streamer shines brightly and it's not you know, for some reason, we need this variety of traces. Yeah. We don't need this variety. This is just what was found on accident. Um, but reliable tracers for us have been HC3N, if the streamers are large. Um, H2CO, pretty much everywhere. It does a really great job, and it's quite bright. Um, and CATO also, but... For that, you have to really understand what your outflow direction is like, because we're often sensitive to C18O you know, in the outflow. So just got to be careful. If you know your outflow well, great. And mm -hmm. those are the main ones for the really low, um, uh, early types. Uh, sorry, the really young ones. Um, and then the uh, class twos, uh, 12CO and sometimes 13CO seem to work, but that relies much more on the modeling and there's I think we just don't have the sensitivity to get some of these more exotic molecules um, in that phase. Mm -hmm. We have a question here from uh, Brandt, uh, Brandt Gashes. So 
Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, great talk. I was just kind of curious for, I mean, for, for these streamers, I mean, I'm just at EPOS where uh, um, um, uh, there was also a talk for the Borage, I think, team there. Um, I mean, it seems like these are just morphologically defined, but there was it was also shown during the talk that uh, simulations have seen this for, you know, well over a decade, just as a consequence of turbulence. But I mean, are your streamers are they similar between the different classes? Do they look like what you see from s s simulations? Uh, and, you know, I'm just kind of, I'm just curious if it's actually like a unified thing or if it's just, you know, turbulent gas that happens to bypass, you know, pass near a protostar and get captured in. Yeah, so I am also curious uh, if this is a unified thing or not. So I think there's probably well, multiple ways to form these streamers, um, actually. Uh, well, the, the the metric might be what is the mass in the streamer compared to the mass in some spherical uh, core scale. How, yeah. how over dense is the streamer? Yeah, it's just so far we don't think we have the full masses of the streamers because we've never done combined single dish and interferometry. Uh, we haven't done too many mosaics. Um, so we've got missing flux, so we don't know. We've got lower limits. Um, but Brant, you're absolutely right that theorists have been working harder on this uh, than we have, and there's tons of things to compare to. That's why I'm down at Texas with Stella Offner, but uh, the large program, large observing program is such a behemoth. Um, Stella and I have like some plans on what we want to do. Um, but we've both been so busy with our own thing. We've been working sort of in parallel and we're just not quite ready for each other. Um, but um, so this is a paper by Tamayuki Hanawa and it's sort of a simple toy model he plays with, but he just shows that you can have a streamer that can be formed by an originally, you know, roundish cloudlet that happens to get captured and then it falls in and it winds up looking like a uh, observation that we have. Um, and then Mike Kufmeyer is also very interested in this. Um, he's been making a lot of zoom in simulations, um, trying to understand like exactly where the endpoint of the streamers are. And right now it seems like as observers, we're missing it. Um, have yeah. you seen them in the continuum? Do, do, do you have continuum measurements in the streams? Um, there are very few. So um, Valentin uh, Leguic is the king of that because he's went for magnetic field um, polarization uh, of, of disks and outflows and accidentally found what we think are streamers, but they haven't been kinematically confirmed. I'm also trying to recruit him to do some stuff with me. Um, but I do have one. I feel like some of my backup slides got it eaten. Um, <laughs> okay, so where you see the red and the blue fuzzy stuff, like ignore the annotations here, um, when you see the red and the blue fuzzy stuff, we actually do have a detection here very faintly in the continuum. I think these things just aren't dense enough that with typical integration times that we use when we're trying to target you know, some of these brighter molecular lines that we're used to working with, um, we don't see a lot of that. But using the big bandwidth of NOEMA, um, there's a workaround where I can make, taking into account the spectral index, like a giant, wildly sensitive map using all the line-free channels. And there are hints of some more in there as well. We just didn't go mm -hmm. deep enough to really get a handle on it. But mm -hmm. I want to dig around actually more in some of the older polarization papers and use that as, you know, let's do like a follow-up survey on some of them to, uh, or just a mini one, um, to actually figure out if these things are like infalling structures that are dragging the magnetic field with them or something. Um, but yeah, for, yes. for, all, for all the things that we have kinematics for, we don't have good dust observations. And for all the things that we have good dust observations for, we don't have the kinematics. I can point you to one example in the high mass, uh, Yi Chen Zhang led it in 2019, where we have continuum and uh, 
we use methanol for the stream up, so we, we're both there, but I don't recall really measuring the mass, particularly of the stream up. But anyway, um, I, I wanted to ask a provocative question then to sort of finish up the discussion. You, sh you showed the HL tau disk is very symmetric. So the question is, um, do the disks care if they've been uh, fed by streamers? Like, is there any correlation of disk property from the e-disk sample with uh, the presence or not of the streamers? Um, you know, I, I haven't dug through and compiled their survey for them. Um, but I am eagerly waiting. I've heard that there is, uh, they are going to work on like a little bit of like some st streamer, like transversal paper. I'm excited for that to come out. That'll be the first step. Um, and then from, uh, my Noema survey, uh, you know, we know about the small scales quite well, especially with VLA data. So, um, when our observations are complete, we can start doing statistics with that as well. Mm -hmm. But anecdotally, um, I mean, just just from the, the, the examples you know so far, is anything standing out at all? Or, I mean, as I recall, in, in sort of protostellar disk side of things, there are, there's a range of disk sizes. Um, our, for example, our, our big disks, when, when you have a streamer, do you typically have a big disk? I guess could be a question. So far, yes, but I think it's biased. We haven't had unbiased surveys yet. Even my Noema survey is biased because we just took the most luminous protostars. I could totally see, I could only see where a streamer might come in with too much mass relative to the disk or a streamer might, instead of approaching near the mid plane, like fall in more pull on. And then that might completely disrupt the disk and make it small. Um, yeah, it's complicated. Uh, it, it's one of the questions I have, and I've been thinking about it for a long time and planning on how to answer. Mm -hmm. And what about binarity? Because you, you showed a couple of, are they all binaries or are there some single stars? Uh, um, both. Streams? I haven't really noticed like a huge bias either way. Um, the larger streamers tend to have binaries a little more often, but we still have small number stats on that and mm -hmm. really patchy and incomplete observations. Great, are there any other questions in Virginia there? I, I can't see, so just we'll go back to you. If it's okay, I have one more question. Um, really cool stuff, thank you, Dom. Uh, when you go from observing up close to the large scale, the intermediate scale is often one of the hardest to probe. Um, how often do you see a case where you're like, I think I have the streamer figured out, and then you get something where you get finally like probing 20 arc second, 30 arc second scale data, and you're like, oh man, that was an outflow and not an infall, or like, how often does the picture change? Is every time you get a new data set, it's like the picture turns over on its head, or does it all sort of fit together neatly? <laughs> There are definitely some where it looks like a streamer and then we try to do the kinematic confirmation and it's not. So yeah, it might be a like outflow, like if it recessed or something, or I don't know, whatever. Um, That's a good point, yeah. Yeah, so they can be falsified. Um, but yeah, I think because there's so much of that intermediate scale missing, we can't do that yet. <laughs> big single dish yeah i mean it's i mean we do have gbt in the queue yeah. um but i mean it was we have this problem yeah. this is the problem we have we go from 300 to maybe a few thousand scale to 30,000 au and there's not much happening in between right. um and i've increasingly started proposing for alma with like uh 12 meter and aca and total power let's go yeah. <laughs> neil evans was like yes <laughs> Great, very good then. I think we are. Uh, oh, we have one last question from Apple here, please. Uh, how far does this molecular patch have to be from the star so that it can become a streamer? Good question. And that sounds like a question for a theorist. Um, <laughs> actually, no, I know. Um, you might have some hints. Um, if you look at recent papers, um, 
by um, Michael Kufmeyer. Um, he's got a few papers since 2019, so look at 2019 and after. And you might have some plots where he's showing some of his simulations, and you might be able to like sort of eyeball like how large some of the structures are. But I don't have an exact number offhand, but I think that's where to find the answer. Very good then. Okay, uh, well, well, it remains to do. Thank you, Dominique, again.